Hi, I'm Dan Easton from Geek Life, and I'm here in our seventh workshop with our seventh engine to show you a finely finished and working system. Uh, if you've never seen Geek before, this is a Geek reactor. What we're running on here is our Honda GX160 generator that's um, a 2000 watt generator. And we have here is the Geek reactor. We're bringing exhaust out of our engine and delivering it into the reactor set through here. It comes down through the outer pipe and then exits through the muffler. Fuel is currently delivered from this carburetor, and I use this as the throttle control. It's fed in here, and it comes up through the internal pipe, and it then comes through the geek gas line here, and down into our air management valve, where we then mix fuel as geek gas and air, and deliver it to the engine. Um, if you've never seen a geek system before, what this does is it's a plasma fuel refinery that splits carbon atoms or sulfur atoms, in, in this case petrol, uh, into hydrogen. It takes them apart on a subatomic level and delivers them around into the engine. I'm going to make another set of videos for you where I'll do a bit more of an explanation of how that works at some point. But for today I want to go through and show you what we have set up here. This is a vacuum gauge and its cable feeds up underneath the generator and around the back there that blue wire uh, comes around to our control box. We'll go into this in a bit more later. We're taking power off the back of the generator it comes down here and feeds into a power meter where we can record the voltage, current, wattages, frequencies and everything to do with the power coming off the engine. That's then fed into this variac. This has been pre-calibrated on mains for the load that's underneath the desk there. So this gives us um, our applied load as if it was mains. So it's a kind of a rough indication of what we should be getting. And then we check back onto the power meter to see what's actually coming out. That then feeds this wire comes around here into our four-way plug and it drops down underneath the bench to this um, two and something thousand watt heater. I've currently got it set to max and max and then we can rev the engine up and change the settings on our control valve here and change its power band and then apply a load so we keep the engine at the same speed and then we can see how much power is coming off. Okay, let's have a quick look at this then. This is our new analyzer box. Um, it's gonna go into a new case in the next few weeks, but for now, I can just show you what we've got here. On the screen on the top, we have uh, lots of data comes from this engine set and from previous engines. I haven't put all the sensors on at the moment because I don't wanna confuse the issue. But what we can record on here is the reactor temperature, its vacuum, the exhaust pressure at the bottom of the reactor, and the power out. And we can cycle through on here um, it will also, these, these knobs here control uh, servos for carburetors and air management valves and that kind of thing. We also have an ultrasound system in here that we can use an ultrasound fuel delivery. So in this mode we have the carburetor setting, the AMV setting, and these are for the um, ultrasound that's not currently being used. That sets up our maximum and minimum positions of our carburetor, so we can tell it where you want it to be. And then over here we have power output, so there is a set of sensors that live in here that records voltage and current and it gives us our average RMS minimum maximum so we can actually take sensor data fast enough to get the waveform of our power. Um, this is the one I've been using at the moment. This is our average vacuum in the middle and then our maximum and minimum that we're actually pulling and underneath it is the exhaust pressure but I haven't got anything set up for that so it's just reading um, random numbers at the moment and then generally one would use it on this setting. So, other sensors that we have for this system is an RPM sensor that lives in here, there's a temperature sensor that lives on there, uh, there's a pressure gauge to go in here, um, the vacuum's already on, and then I'm going to put a CO2 sensor on the end. I have had a couple before, but they're a chemical based um, sensor and they wear out and they don't like being exposed to the, the um, exhaust gases when the engine starts. But obviously when it starts it's not actually reacting properly it has to come up to the correct temperatures and the correct vacuums so it tends to clog up that type sensor um, at some point in the next few weeks i'll get a infrared co2 sensor and put on here so we can look at this but i'm also getting um, a five gas analyzer so we can look at exactly what the emissions are coming out of here um, around here on the workbench we have this device this is one of our own personal beautiful pieces of equipment this is a 3d magnetic field scanner Inside the reactor, there's the bit that makes it all work properly, which is steel rods that look about like this, okay? 
These pick up a magnetic field off of the reactor and they end up with an imprint. So we pop this into here and then we can extend this arm out and run it up and down past our rod and take scans on it, which comes up on our display here and we can look at the magnetic imprint on the rod. One of the things that is a, a particular cu um, a curiosity of GEET is that these rods end up with a reversing magnetic field. Um, not sure if this is one that I've actually run yet, so we'll just have a quick look. Oh, yeah, there we go. You see how the back of the rod pulls the north of the needle. Sorry, this compass actually, it's a cheap one and it reads backwards. So that's actually south. Okay, so the south of the rod is at the bottom. We turn the rod over and put it on there and it attracts the same end of the needle. Okay. That only happens when your reactors are running properly. Everyone used to just use a compass to determine this, but we realized that there's a lot more information about how the system's performing that's encoded in that imprint, hence building this device over here. I'll make a proper set of videos where I go through that as an individual thing, and this as an individual thing. Over here, we have another piece of equipment that's actually nothing to do with GEET. This is a space-time antenna. Um, if you look up Bashar's videos, you'll find out what this is. Um, it's actually something that came through for us in around 2000 as well. We've been kind of working with this for a while. What I have on the top here is a EM field scanner with an amplifier on board. So I can listen to the sound off of our reactor through here. And I'm just using this as the aerial at the moment. Um, what we're picking up is the field that's generated around the reactor. And I'll go into that on its own individual video. And then here we have our bubbler. Um, this one's not quite ready for use yet. I'm not happy with the way it performs. So I need to make a few changes to it. If you want to run something to this engine that isn't petrol, uh, and my personal favorite is ginger beer um, or coffee or tea, then trying to get that through a carburetor is a little difficult. And it's much easier to put it into a bubbler like this and have it vaporize the fuel for us and send it into the reactor. We've got another engine lurking around over there. That's another one I've been working on. Again, not quite happy with that. But this one, uh, a couple of months ago, I was in Holland working with the new dealership over there, and they have one of these engines. We managed to get a perfect balanced system. So I've replicated what we had in Holland and then advanced that process a little bit more to increase the power output and the efficiency gains. And then I'm going to use this as my test bed to go away from the perfect conditions and look at what happens with our field effects and look at what happens with emissions and power banding and all the rest of it. And then when I've got my head around that a little bit more, we're going to apply it back to this engine and see if we can make this one do exactly what this one is doing. Okay, so I'm going to have to stop the video and start the engine up and set it up to produce various loads and different things and do some running conditions and show you the system running and then uh, we'll take it from there I guess. There we go then, so here's a running system. Okay, and with valves currently set where they are, we are loading just over 500 watts. We've got 225 volts, 22 volts in loop. 2.83 amps and it fluctuates a little bit. 540 watts and our peak has been 589. And you can see over here we're running up right vacuums, that's slightly higher. So there's our maximum, minimum, and average vacuum. And then if we look at the reactor temperature, okay, there is the uh, top of the reactor. Now, what's this? went up in the middle. That is a breakdown point where fuel is splitting and it produces a hot spike on the reactor. So we know that our rod is floating beautifully in the middle of the reactor here and doing its job. And we're producing some power and it's running and it's using up fuel. Um, and I'm in a closed room here. Yeah. So if you ran this engine in a closed room normally, you would gas yourself. But the emissions on these engines are super clean. I'll have a little talk about that later on in the video. For now, I'm going to stop this one, reset the valve, and lift the power band up and see what else we can get out of it. 
Okay, so that's happy looking up itself a minute. What I'd like to look at is on here. If I press this, that is our peak achieved power, 1800 watts. In one moment there, we had it just right. Uh, cost of power, there we go. So currently on a lower voltage, a lower load, running at the right speed, previous amps, 500 watts. But yeah, 1800 watts is our peak. Ooh, and it's off. Okay, I'll have a bit of load. There you go then. Okay, let's have another look at the temperature and see what happened when we ran it that hard. Perfect. And there should still be some temperature spikes. There we go. Okay, let's turn this off so you can hear. Because that is rather loud. Okay, look. Here on our fuel inlet, 49 Fahrenheit, switch to Celsius. Five degrees Celsius going in there. I've got 20 odd degrees time it comes into the engine. We've got, you know, a couple of hundred degrees here, 150s. This engine, when it was running on normal petrol, uh, go back to that. That's the same spark plug temperature as this engine produces when it's at full, full, full load on a, a normal carburetted system. That is 40 or 50 degrees cooler than this engine would have been. The air is a little bit warm, so 30 to 40 degrees cooler on there. Um, the oil casing used to do about 90 something to 100. And then just on that spot there, 95. So I'm not overheating an engine. We're not burning out valves and doing anything. It's not running lean. It's using fuel. It's converting petrol, in this case, into hydrogen sending it through into the engine and it's running and it's producing 1800 watts of power at one point there um, originally 2000 watts that's what this is designed to do so we've just got 80 odd percent of the performance out of this engine that we had before i did some of them on video and and make a nice log for you all um, this type engine at five six hundred watts would run for around three quarters of an hour maybe a little bit more maybe a little bit less on a liter of fuel uh, two days ago, this engine, and it wasn't quite as perfect as it is now, it had a 70% um, increase in efficiency and actually ran for 40 minutes on a half a litre of fuel, knocking out five or 600 watts.